gonna come down here a little more intimate. First Peter is where we are, and in a way, this is kind of a continuation of last Sunday night. We talked about uh, last Sunday night recognizing what side that we're on as we're talking about the warfare that we fight against. We've got, uh, I don't know how the Lord's going to lead in the future of this, but we're going to have a lot of lessons on, on the enemy, recognizing the enemy and who we're fighting against in this spiritual warfare. We'll talk about the war. What is the spiritual warfare we're fighting? We'll talk about all these things, but right now we're just talking about ourselves a little bit. Uh, we're talking about knowing uh, what side we're on, recognizing what side we're on. So we talked a lot about that. There were some things I'm afraid I didn't, didn't get super clear last, uh, last week, but there's no sense to rehash it. I'm just going to move forward. Uh, first, Peter can be a little confusing and a little uh, uh, rough, maybe, to read through, and especially with the, uh, the prepositions there, uh, you know, you read something and you're, you don't know how to take it. And, well, think of it this way. I, I read something that said, if you said, uh, uh, this man is wanted for murder, you could mean he's wanted because he murdered somebody, so he's wanted, or you could mean he's wanted to murder somebody, you know, <laughs> he's wanted for murder. I want him so that, you know, I can get him to murder somebody or whatever. So, uh, and, and that's just how the English language is. And it's gone back all the way, you know, through the, uh, in the 1500s. In fact, okay, real quick, I won't, I won't go back to last week's message too much, I, I promise. But we talked about the word election and how it said uh, that we are the elect. And then it said, well, we're already there. Let's look at 1 Peter. Uh, it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, that word unto is the confusing part of that whole passage. You're like, what does that mean? We're elect and uh, uh, unto obedience and unto the sprinkling of blood, which uh, the way I tried to explain it last week, and what I think is that sprinkling, sprinkling of blood is referring to the salvation of, of Christ. And, and so anyway, made some references there. But, but unto, if you look back in the Geneva Bible in the 1500s before the you know, it was kind of a rough draft, if you will. King James was kind of a final draft of these English versions. In a way, you look at that Geneva Bible, it says, uh, who are, uh, sanct let's see, um, sanct uh, through the sanctification of the Spirit, and then it says, through obedience and the sprinkling. I'm not saying King James is wrong. I'm just saying you see how that use of the preposition can be real confusing. And all throughout the book of Peter, it's kind of confusing like that. So you read it, sometimes you've got to read it three or four times look at the context of the whole thing and try to figure out what exactly he's saying. It's kind of deep there, especially since we don't live in the culture and, and uh, you know, he was, he was Jewish and we're not Jewish, so we don't understand some of the things and customs and stuff that they were talking about. But today we're going to talk about, uh, uh, tonight we're going to talk about this. Is, here's the title. We don't run with those guys anymore. All right? We don't run with those guys anymore. And, the, and, and this is straight from our, uh, our text here. And I'm going to read that. I'm going to read these passages in a minute. But first, just to kind of set the stage, I want you to think in your mind of this situation. And this has happened in our country before. Somebody from Japan, let's say, you know, they grew up in Japan. They didn't. They they loved their land as much as they could love their land during during the uh, the time of the the government and communism and everything. And it was back in World War II. And uh, somehow their parents bring them to the United States of America, and through the legal process, they become members of the United States of America. And then w World War breaks out, and now they have got to fight for their country, they're Americans now, and they've got to fight against Japan, their homeland. That'd be a crazy situation, wouldn't it? Uh, my dad being in the military, we were in Japan for a while, and I fell in love with the people and the, and the culture of that day. Uh, and I had a love for, for the people because I grew up there from seven years old. We were there about three, four years. And then we went back to Okinawa, Japan, several years after that when I was a teenager. And, uh, and I remember thinking, because we're on military bases and there's all this talk about war and everything. And I remember thinking, what would happen if I, 
we went into war and we were fighting against Japan and I had to fight these people. I wouldn't want to have them as my enemies. I love, I love this place, you know. Uh, but certainly in World War, that, that happened. There were uh, Japanese that had to fight against the Japanese because uh, they, were, they were Americans. And, and I don't know all that went on to that. That'd be a, it, it's an interesting story to learn. But So here's the thing. In First Peter, we read uh, a little bit about this. And this is what we're going to uh, look at tonight. That's kind of what goes on here. And in in First Peter uses the terminology of this. Uh, we were, now, I've got to be careful how I say it, but we were Gentiles. Now, not, I mean, we are Gentiles phys- still, you know, in, in physically of the flesh, we're Gentiles. But we were Gentiles. Here's a picture, uh, the whole picture of the Old Testament. And we were strangers when God called us out of, of those people, and we became a, a, a holy, a peculiar people unto the Lord. We were, in, we were strangers going through the land. You read all throughout the Bible and, and you know, Hebrews talks about uh, all these were strangers and pilgrims, you know, going through the land. They were looking for a uh, promise of God, you know, in a city not built with hands and talking about the heaven, the new Jerusalem and, and, and all. So, so they're, uh, uh, but kind of metaphorically in our text, we're going to read about where it's talking about Gentiles and it's saying, hey, we once were like the Gentiles, and we're no longer Gentiles. Now, again, I know fleshly, there's a difference between Jew, Gentile, I, under, I understand that. But, uh, but as far as it goes, and I mean, if you look at the beginning, we talked about last week, it's talking about strangers scattered abroad, uh, these, these lands, and people say, well, that's the Jewish dysphoria. He's talking to Jews. Well, he's, oh, you could say he's talking to Jews, but really he's talking to people that are saved, Right? People that are born again. Therefore, there's no no Jew or Gentile. Once somebody's saved, you're in Christ or you're not in Christ, right? So this picture that he paints, he's painting it to Christians, and he's saying that uh, that you were Gentiles. And I'll show you some of those verses, but let's look at 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, and again, it's kind of a continuation from last week, so just bear with me. Wherefore, gird up the loins of of your mind, you think about girding up as kind of like cinching up your belt. Uh, you know, my first thought was the, the karate kid, you know, you put that on, they cinch up. <laughs> okay, not talking about your head, your mind, all right? This is kind of a picture, a metaphor, but, but that it's ready. Be of a ready mind. So gird up your mind, the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Um, I went farther than I was supposed to, but that's okay. Chapter 2. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Now, that's some of the terminology that he used for, his, for the chosen people, the Jews of the Old Testament, some of the terminology that he use, uses for them. But what he says here is that, which were in time past not a people, but are now a people of God, which hath not obtained, uh, which hath now, I'm sorry, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. All right, now skip over to uh, chapter 4. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to, uh, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, which uh, we walk in lasciviousness, 
that's kind of unbridled lust, just you know, going after what you want. Lusts, excess of wine, revelings, you know, that's just obsessive partying and, and uh, banquetings uh, and abominable, abominable uh, idolatries. Wherein, look at this first, verse 4. Wherein they, who's they? Those Gentiles that we're talking about. They think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall give an account to them, uh, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached unto them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now, uh, so you see this idea uh, for in time past of our lives. Uh, it says that we've wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and all these things. And then it says that uh, uh, they think it's strange that we don't run with them anymore. Basically, what is it? They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right. Now, I was saved as a little kid, so maybe I haven't experienced what some of you folks have experienced, but I hear stories all the time, preachers and what have you, that say they lived a, a partying lifestyle as a teen and, and maybe into their 20s, they were partying, drinking, maybe drugs, what have you, and then the Lord saved them. And then they're going back to their friends and trying to preach the gospel to them, and they're saying, no, I don't do those things anymore. Hey, come party with us. I don't do those anything. And they couldn't understand it. And they laughed at them and mocked at them and said, that's not going to last. You'll be back with us before you know it and all this kind of stuff. They just didn't understand. Why aren't you doing those things with us anymore? Now, I, I was, like I said, saved at a young age, so I never did some of those things. And I remember going, even uh, at, when I was working at UPS and became a supervisor and everybody's trying to, you know, rub uh, elbows with the, the big guys and they're, they're, they're trying to wine and dine people. Hey, come, come party with us at this place. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And you know that in the workplace today, that really will hinder you sometimes from promotions. That'll hinder you from, uh, from advancement or for people even uh, wanting to hang around you or whatever, just because you say, nah, I'm not going to do that. Why? Well, because I'm a Christian. <gasps> Are you saying I'm not a Christian? Well, you're not acting like a Christian, right? You know, we're going to get into that in a minute too. But, but so the Bible is saying that you've come out from among them. Okay, you're no longer with them. In fact, now you are strangers in their world. But we read here where it says that we do, uh, we still look at First, uh, first Peter 2, 9 again. First Peter 2, 9 Uh, actually, 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust. Look at this, which war against the soul, your soul. So you, you, we, even though we're strangers and pilgrims in this land, we're not of this world anymore, right? We're in the world, not of the world. You've heard that phrase. Yet those same lusts, they war against us. Now, I don't lust after alcohol because I never had a problem with it or a drink. But there's other things you know, that I struggle with. There's, I think there's some, something that everybody in here struggles with. There's no doubt about it. There's, there's fleshly uh, lust, the lusts and desires that we have. Okay, so um, point number one I want to make is this. And I kind of alluded to this last week, but the citizens of this world are not our enemy. Okay, the people in this world that are caught up, alcohol, drugs, pornography, uh, riotous living, uh, covetous, you know, uh, anything, any of these, these lusts and pleasures you can think of. The ones that are caught up, they're not our enemy. We don't hate them. They're not necessarily against us, right? But it's those lusts and those desires and that lifestyle that's consuming them that used to consume us and wants to consume us that is part of the enemy to some degree, whether it's, you know, Satan you know, tempting us with these things, whether it's our own flesh just wanting to go, whatever the case, that's what we're against. That's what is warring against us, according to our text. So, uh, so it's not that the, uh, the citizens, last week we called them civilians, they're not the enemy, right? Uh, but they are in the same lust of ignorance, as the, our text said, lust of ignorance. They don't know any better. 
All right. Now, as Christians, we ought to know better. But when they're caught up in it and they're on that side, if you would, they don't know any better. They're caught up in it. So they're not our enemy. Uh, they are just caught. They're prisoners of their lust and what have you. We have chosen, I hope, to forsake it, to forsake those things, forsake that lifestyle, forsake those lusts, and, uh, and follow Christ. It said in our text here that we continue in hope until our salvation. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, a, that's a little bit of an interesting thing. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Uh, uh, first, I think that was in the beginning. 1 Peter 1. Do, do, do. Okay. Wherefore gird, up, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is uh, be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So until Christ comes, until Christ is revealed, and uh, in the basically the end of this, this life as we know it, until that time, it says that we are to hope until it comes. Now that word used to confuse me because it's almost like crossing your fingers. You know, I just hope I'm saved. You know, I just hope, I'm just going to keep trusting. I'm going to keep putting my faith in him the best I can. I'm hoping, but that's not what it means. And, and, I, and I realized this as I was studying for uh, Wednesday's, this coming Wednesday's uh, sermon. Look at Proverbs 11. Hope, keep your place in 1 Peter. And I've learned this before, but this, as I was going through this in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 11, uh, it just kind of jumped out at me. Uh, let's see here, Proverbs 11. And first of all, look at uh, verse 7. When a wicked man, now, real quickly, sometimes in Proverbs you notice it'll use two words and they'll be total contrast to each other, and sometimes they're uh, synonyms you know, of each other, but it'll use different words in, in that. That's just kind of the poetic word. Uh, way that the way that it's constructed there in verse seven it says a wicked man dieth when a wicked man dieth his expectation shall perish and the hope of unjust um, uh, and the hope of unjust men perisheth okay so there you see this connection between hope and expectation look at verse twenty three of the same chapter it says the desire of the righteous is only good but the expectation of the wicked is wrath, and so you begin to form a little bit of a definition, I believe, of what we talk, what we're talking about when we say hope, and that's just it's like a, a desire, but not a desire that says I hope so, I hope so. It's a desire, it's an expectation. It's saying I know that day is coming, and I can't wait for that day to get here. And I'm, and I'm gonna. Uh, uh, it says in the book of uh, uh, Romans, Paul said, "I reckon myself to be dead to sin." We got to daily remind ourselves, hey, I'm a Christian and I'm on this road right here. And we remind ourselves and we uh, continue to walk down that road with an expectation of what we have in the end. Okay, so the citizens of this world are not our enemy, but the lusts that consume them continue to war against us as well. Uh, 1 John 2, 16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. I, I know I'm, uh, there's several more points I want to make. I'm spending a little bit of time on this point, but I want to look at Galatians because I think this is going to help us a little bit. If we need to recognize the enemy, and if lust is warring against us, if there's some, something about these desires that are warring against us, we want to know what that is. Galatians chapter 5 is a good place to go. Galatians chapter 5 Starting in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now, you can't walk in the Spirit if you're not saved. You can make yourself be good. Uh, being good is like a trained behavior. You can make somebody who's not saved, you can train them to be good. You can train an animal to be good. And so there are good people out there who aren't saved. But, but you can't walk in the Spirit and in the, in, in, in the wisdom of, of God unless you are saved. Now, where was I? Uh... Galatians 5, 16. It says uh, this, I say, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that you would. 
But if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, here, here goes our list that kind of help us understand. Now, the works of the flesh are, manif are manifest, which are these. You can see these sexual type sins, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Then you have uh, uh, idolatry. You say, eh, we don't really worship idols anymore in America. We worship idols all the time. <laughs> Uh, one of these days, and I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say it. One of these days, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a series on Catholicism because Catholicism is all over this community, and it's not that I want to be mean and ugly and, and bash on on Catholics, but I think there's some things that need to be said about Catholicism. I was just telling one of my one of my kids earlier today. I said it's so weird, and it's got to be a ploy of Satan. But but almost everything the Bible says not to do, Catholics do. Don't make any graven images. You know, this beautiful house down here. I said, oh, this is great. They put flowers in there. They did all this. I just love that house. And all of a sudden, I saw Mary in whatever other. I don't, I don't, I don't know what they are. And, I mean, I think that's an idol. And they say certain prayers to them. And then the Bible says, don't, uh, you don't use vain repetition. And they got those beads, and they say, our, our, you know, I don't even know how the prayers go. But Mother Mary, full of whatever. And they, and they just, yeah. no vain repetition. Well, they do it. It says, uh, uh. Um, call no man father. What well, they call a priest, the father. Don't forbid it. Don't forbid anybody to marry. They forbid their priest to marry. I mean, just go down the line. It's crazy. <laughs> How do you not see that? You know. But anyway, one we'll we'll save that for for another day. But but it just blows my mind how much in the Bible uh, they're against that. But idolatry, yeah, that's there. And, and and for people that maybe maybe it's not a spiritual thing. You ever heard of American Idol? <laughs> I mean, American Idol, our, our, our American, the American Idols are, are uh, superstars, athletes, um, talented musicians, and what have you. And, and our teens and, our, and even grown uh, adults, they worship these things. You know? Anything that you put before God, your desires on this thing instead of, more than it is of God, can be an idol. And it says idolatry. That's one of the lusts of the flesh. Uh, witchcraft. Well, I say, oh, we don't do any, we don't have a desire for witchcraft. Well, I think we do. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very common for people to run to superstitious beliefs. You ever notice that? You know, well, I better get the newspaper, check my horoscope. Why? What's that going to do for you? I don't know. But people will run to those. People will look up all these superstitious things. Why am I going to make sure I do that? You know. Now, this is, I know, just playing, playing around, but i got to make sure I don't wash that shirt or else my team might lose. <laughs> we just have this certain desire and this lust to, uh, uh, to, towards, you know, this uh, kind of superstition. And, and uh, which, not only that, uh, you know, you see advertisements for movies all the time, and it, you see demonic stuff, just crazy. Witchcraft and, uh, and, and demons and... And the living dead and, and all this kind of stuff. Just, just why? Because it's a lot. Not every lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes has to do with sexual stuff. Sometimes you just want to see gore. Sometimes, I mean, I'm not saying <laughs> you, but sometimes people want to see gore. Or they want to see uh, just, uh, uh, you know, how about, how about this? I actually like, uh, uh, I'm getting way off, off notes here, but, but I like watching, you know, boxing and uh, these UFC, like people beating each other up. But one time I stopped and thought, why do I want to watch this guy hitting another guy in the face until he's bloody? I don't know what, that's a lust of the flesh, <laughs> a lust of the eyes. I want to see this kind of stuff. And it's not necessarily something at all that's good to see, right? So you got to, we got to be careful, guard against that kind of stuff. Uh, the lust of the uh, flesh. Okay, witchcraft. Uh, let's see here. I left off hatred. Variance, and now another uh, group of words that have to do with the same thing. You know, you hate somebody, you're at variance with them, striving against them. Uh, uh, emulation is kind of like an envious uh, thing. Wrath, uh, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. Then you go back to these uh, sins here, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. 
we, met, if we left anything out, you get the picture. Such like, <laughs> all right, of that, of the which I tell you before, and I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, is that saying that if somebody got drunk, now they can't be saved anymore? No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying one day when you're in heaven, you're not going to do those kinds of things. Nobody in heaven is going to be struggling with these sins right here. Because this is not what heaven's made up of. The kingdom of heaven is not these types of things. All right? So, uh, so those of you who are going to inherit the kingdom of God, those of you who are elect unto those kinds of things that Christ promised uh, to give you, why would you want to go live that way? Those aren't things of the Lord. Those aren't things of the Spirit. Those are things of the flesh. And that's the point that he's trying to make. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And if they that are Christ's uh, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I'm sorry. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. All right, so... Uh, so I went a long time on that one point. The rest are going to go real fast. But the idea there is that, uh, that lust there is the enemy. Not the people that are uh, prisoners of that sin or lust, but lust, we've got to watch it. That's the enemy, and it still wars against us in the flesh. First Peter, back to 1 Peter chapter 4. We already read it once. We'll read it again here. 1 Peter chapter 4. One through five says this, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to, uh, uh, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Therein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excessive riot, speaking evil of you. Okay, the second point I want to make real quickly is this. The world, they might not be the enemy, but they do see you as an enemy to the things they want to do, right? As soon as you begin to talk about the standards of the Bible, I'm not talking about just your own made-up traditions and standards, but I'm saying you say, hey, well, the Bible says this. You, ought, you shouldn't do this. They will get offended at you. And you're saying, I'm not, I haven't even said anything against you. I've just said this is what the Bible says. Well, you shouldn't judge. You know, that's, I remember one time, I remember one time preaching a message here, uh, and I was talking about addictions. And my point was, we all have addictions. I have addictions, you have addictions, we all have addictions. And that's the way I said it. And then, I, and then I began to list what some of those addictions are. That uh, My addiction might not be your addiction, but I was listing them and, er and everything. And at the end of the service, somebody said, you ought to try reading Matthew, uh, oh, what is it, Matthew, Matthew 7, 1, I think, where he says, judge not, that you be judged. <laughs> and so that is the number one misquoted, taken out of context passage in the whole Bible. Everybody memorizes that. Two words, judge not. And they'll just... Lean on that for everything. Why? Because if they can get you to stop telling them, the, or not even just telling them, but saying that the things that they do are wrong, then whew, they can take a breath, right? They count you as the enemy of what they want to do, okay? Keeping them from doing what they want to do, unfortunately. So, number three, the best thing we can do then for them, the people that are caught up in the lust, people of the world, and what, the best thing we can do is introduce them to our king. All right. James 5.20 says, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. Now, I think that context is actually talking about Christians, but same thing. You've got a Christian that's, that's fallen, you know, and he's fallen back into lust. He hadn't fallen from salvation, but, but, but you, need to, you need to try to get them back on the right path. You might save their soul. You say, oh, their soul... Uh, the part that goes to heaven? No, remember we talked about 
uh, I think it was on, uh, last Wednesday, we talked about the difference between soul and spirit and mind. Sometimes you don't know what the difference is. You have to read the context and you got to get, uh, uh, get all the understanding of what that passage is saying to understand. But I believe it's talking about saved people. But what he's saying about saving your soul has to do with uh, your whole being, okay, who you are. And you get them back on track. Oh, yeah, thank you. You know, you, you saved me. All right. And so I think that's what it's talking about. Proverbs 1130 says this could be kind of along the same lines, but I think this is actually talking about converting a lost person, uh, even though it's in the Old Testament. The fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. That's where we get that term, soul winning. Uh, the idea is, is, uh, is t- telling somebody what is right, convincing them that that's right, and, uh, and, and winning them, converting them to, to whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. It could be just winning them to your side. You know, if, if, if it's an argument, some kind of debate or something. But, of course, in, Christian, in the Christian life, Jesus has left us with the great commandment. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, okay? So our job is not to win them unto ourselves, but to win them unto Christ and unto uh, the word of God. And so, uh, so there will never be a conversion or a winning of a soul, if you will, as long as there's no challenge to their current state. Does that make sense? Uh, I grew up, uh, I mean, not grew up, I, when I first went to Bible college, now they taught us personal evangelism and soul winning, and so I'm not uh, talking bad about them in that way, but, but also a very popular thing that was taught was this lifestyle evangelism. Now, the idea was, if I live righteously, others will see that, and they'll be drawn to that, and they will hopefully be saved. The problem is that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, they usually don't just come. Well, I mean, they might recognize that you're different, and that might be a, a great thing. But uh, uh, but usually they're just oh, you're weird, and they'll leave you alone, <laughs> right? Or or if they need something, they'll come to you and say, Hey, can you help me with that? Because they know you're a Christian, <laughs> whatever whatever the case. But uh, 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 but what's going to win somebody is what we call confrontation. Now, confrontation is a bad word. <laughs> you know, no, you don't want to be confrontational. Well, I do want to be confrontational in this way. You know, if you died today in your current state, you would go to hell. That's confrontational. Now, let me show you what the Bible says because I love you. I want to see you not go to hell. I want to see you go to heaven. It's still confrontation and you're trying to win them to, uh, uh, to the Lord. The best thing that we can do for those people, the civilians, if you will, that aren't our enemies, but they're on the enemy's side and they're caught up in this lust and everything. Best thing we could do is teach them Christ. And that's why people get confused and say, wait a minute, I have to go into the world. Jesus sat among sinners. You know, we got to be uh, reaching people. I've had people say, you should send your kids to, the, to a public school because uh, if you don't send them, who's going to reach them in the public school? Well, you want to put that on my kid? <laughs> you know what I mean? That hasn't been grown yet. I haven't finished even teaching them the best that I can uh, to, to, before I send them out into the world. You just want me to hand them over to the wolves? Well, maybe you'll win somebody to the Lord. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's, that's right. But the, uh, but so people get this idea that, no, we have to be of the world. We have to be like the world. We have to, that's the only way we're going to reach them. That's not true. Okay. But we do have to confront them. I'm not talking about being ugly or, or whatever, but we do have to be among them and say, you know what? Can I tell you the truth? And that's what Jesus did, by the way. When he sat down with his sinners, like everybody likes to always uh, quote that, he was sitting down with them to tell them that what they were doing is wrong and they need to change. All right. And so, uh, so there needs to be a confrontation. Um, uh, otherwise, there's most likely not going to be any kind of conversion or winning of the soul. Okay. Fourth point, the worst thing we can do as a Christian is to continue letting them see us. Okay, they know we're a Christian. We tell them we're a Christian. We go to church. They see us go to church. Maybe I, even as a pastor, they know I'm a pastor. But then they see me live just like them. That's the absolute worst thing we can do for them. You say, well, how's that? At least, you, you know, at least you're, uh, you're a Christian and you're teaching. No, no, no. Look, if I'm not a Christian and I live like they do, it doesn't mean anything different to them. They're, they're already living that way, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. If I'm a Christian and I live that way, here's what it's doing. It's showing them that, oh, I can be a Christian and just live however I want to live. That's great. Sign me up. I'll be a Christian. Now, uh, 
Now, <laughs> theoretically, you do not have to change a thing to be saved. All right? I, I say that with caution because I realize how that sounds. Theoretically, your salvation has nothing to do with your works. Right? We believe in faith alone. You come to the Lord by trusting him, by putting your faith in him. Uh, you do not get saved by turning over a new leaf, uh, by trying to become a better person, by forsaking your sins. That's not how you come to the Lord, okay? Now, that's all theoretically. It's true, but that's all uh, uh, theoretically. But the truth of the matter is all throughout the Bible, here's what we see. A Christian, uh, when they get saved, they belong to the Lord. And the Bible says, you are a new creature. Now, that doesn't mean nothing changes in my flesh, you know. My desires are still the same. It's very, very rare that you'll see somebody get saved and all of a sudden they're pouring out the alcohol and they're getting a haircut and they're changing the ways that they, they, that they dress. And they're, it happens sometimes. Throwing the cigarettes out and, and, and all. It happens sometimes, but that's very rare. You know, usually what happens is they wake up the next day and they're like, whoa, my cravings didn't go away. My desires for the flesh didn't, didn't go away. I'm still in this human body. And some people will begin to think, maybe I didn't get saved. And they'll struggle with that for their whole life. No, that's not what saves you. What saves you is deciding to put your trust in the Lord and calling on him to save you. And then it's, it's recognizing in the Bible that God's promised that now I'm saved. Right? But inside something happens. The Holy Spirit moves in. And, uh, and when the Holy Spirit moves in, you're not the same person. Like I said the other day, kind of jokingly uh, that I heard somebody say about, you know, you're one third. You know, if your spirit, your spirit saved until the day of redemption, it's pure, it's clean. And in heaven, it's, you know, it's, it can go in because it's, it's spotless. So therefore, if your body, soul, and spirit, you're, you're one third of you is perfect. That's great. <laughs> and I like that. I like that analogy. Uh, in a way, that's true. Okay. But there's a part of you, when the Holy Spirit moves inside, there's a part of you that knows right and wrong. And there's a part of you that, uh, uh, that he said, uh, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. There's a part of you that says, whoa, I need my shepherd. Now you might get off track. You might fall. You might sin. Doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but you get back up and say, whoa, I need, I need the help of my shepherd. Where's my shepherd? And the more you know the Bible, the more the Holy Spirit uh, directs you to the right passages and it helps to confirm you. Uh, that you are saved. So many people say, I just think I'm not saved anymore. Well, the reason you feel that way because you're not reading the Bible. You're not trying to live right for the Lord. You feel this distance from the Lord. He's still there. Holy Spirit's still in you. Uh, you just need to uh, get, get right. So, but the problem is so many people today, they'll claim the name of Christ. They'll say, yes, I'm a Christian. I pray every day and I do this and that. I mean, you, you, you can go knock on doors. They'll all tell you that. But their lifestyle is no different from anybody else. The ones that, that claim not to, be, to believe, uh, there's no, no difference in the way that they live. Okay, so what that does is it causes confusion. And now there are a lot of people out there that aren't saved who say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and they just keep living the same way. Now, it's not that they're not saved because they didn't change their life. It's that they're not saved because they never saw a need to accept Christ. Why accept Christ? I'm not, he's not going to change me. I'm going to be the same way as this uh, guy that calls himself a Christian. is. So there's no true desire to call on the Lord. They just think, oh, well, I'll just try to be like him. And I'll, I'll write that label Christian on, my, uh, you know, on me, and, and, and then I'll be a Christian. So the, one of the worst things we can do is to, to, to the person that's lost is to be a Christian, call ourselves a Christian, and continue uh, to let them see us live uh, the same life that, that they're living. 1 Peter 4, 6. Wrapping it up now. I promise. This is an unfortunate. We're, we're right there. Uh, we stopped at 5. 6 says this, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. All right, they're dead now. They didn't hear it, right? Uh, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And, uh, and what I wanted to key in there is that uh, there comes a day where you've preached it. You've already preached to them. They reject it. Don't want anything to do with you. They still mock it at you for not living it up like they live it up. There is no reason at that point to keep hanging out with them. 
I tried to teach this to the teenagers, and they just, they would not get it. You know, if they're your friend, they're your friend for life. Man, you got to do everything together. No, if you decided to follow the Lord, you are now a stranger and a pilgrim in this land. And now that means there's friends, and that means there's family members, and that means there's people that, sure, you've tried to tell them the gospel. You've tried to say, hey, you need to come over to this side. <laughs> God is good. You need to taste and see that God is good. And they refuse. They reject. Well, I can about guarantee you that the more you hang out with them, the more they're going to rub off on you. You're not going to rub off on them. Uh, and so, so there comes a time where you, you don't have to be ugly. You don't have to just forsake, you know, your, uh, you know, turn your back on them. And all. You can still be nice to them and everything, but there comes a time where you say, you know, we can't hang out anymore. And that's exactly what it said in, uh, uh, <laughs> I love the wording there, and where I got that, that title is that is, uh, they, don't, they don't run with them anymore. All right. Uh, let me read this uh, in closing uh, verse. Uh, uh, let me see here. Let's start, with, uh, let's start with verse 10. We're going to read out the rest of the chapter in closing, I'm, and then I'm, I'm done. I won't say anything else after it. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as, steward, uh, as stewards of the man, manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I'll stop there. It's a good place to stop. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word and for the truths of, of uh, the Bible. Uh, some sayings are hard.